It is my pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker, a man who was conveniently born on April 24th. Many of you might remember Eric Bogosian from his play and subsequent movie, Talk Radio, which was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in 1987. Today, many of you might recognize him as Captain Danny Ross on the TV show Law and Order Criminal Intent. Recently, Mr. Bogosian was in Ann Arbor as the artist in residence at the University of Michigan, thanks to the Manoogian Simone Foundation. There, he hoped to transpose his new book, Operation Nemesis, into other media, such as film and theater. In his opinion, theater is an entertaining way for us to experience walking in another man's shoes. So, let's walk in his shoes tonight as we welcome the actor, playwright, and novelist, Eric Bogosian. I'm honored to be here tonight in this uh, meeting for remembrance of the Armenian Genocide. I lost two great-grandfathers in that horror show. I didn't even know it until I began work on this book. I think my grandparents would be amazed to see me here uh, in front of you tonight. I, uh, we didn't talk about the genocide very much. Uh, if we did, it wasn't in terms of the large-scale understanding of what happened. It was more on a small scale. I don't think my own grandparents really understood what had happened to them. My grandmother, who was from Istanbul, said that her father went to the army and he didn't come back. And that was all she seemed to know about it. So in my family, there was a great deal of ignorance about what had actually happened. Uh, but my other grandmother, Grandma Rose, uh, was always going to Detroit, and uh, we didn't know why. She seemed to be having some kind of party here all the time. She was <laughs> coming for AGBU dances, I guess, or something you guys were doing here. So that's how I first became aware of Detroit, really. Uh, she lived to be over 100 years old. Uh, she was from Dikrenegirt, and uh, had, they had left in the 1890s. Uh, it's a complex and multifaceted story, the story that we carry with us. I'm going to read to you a little bit from my book, which is, um, you'll just have to read it, but it's about um, Operation Nemesis, which is not very well known, and it is, this, it is a true story of the brave men and some women who avenged the Armenian Genocide uh, five years after World War I. Um, this operation was based in the United States. It was based in New England and New York State. Uh, it was headed by Armin Garo and Shahan Natali, and their fedayeen were all over Europe and successfully assassinated six major Turkish leaders after the genocide and, and others. Um, the story is here for you to look at. Um, I'm going to just read one, I'm going to read a couple of things from the book, but first I'm going to read, because today is a day of, where we are, this is a day of memorial, I'm going to just read something that I, I felt was absolutely necessary to have in this book, which was accurate descriptions of what happened during the genocide, and I know that everybody here is familiar with these stories, but uh, th this, uh, in my research, I tried to find the most authentic material I could find. Uh, there has been so a great deal of new material that has shown up in the last decade or so. A uh, German uh, man named Wolfgang Gust has published stuff from the uh, German archives that's very important, very significant. 
Of course, Raymond Kevorkian has finished his major book on the Armenian Genocide, and there's much more research. But this comes, and I wanted this to be in the book, along with missionary statements and other things. This is from a project by a woman named Virginie Zvaslian. And for 35 years, she collected stories by people who had been there. And most of them, many of them, were children. Because, of course, the survivors were children because their parents had been murdered. The children uh, witnessed things, and these are their testimony. I put some of this in the book. Because you're seeing it from children's eyes, it's very intense. This particular episode I'm going to read to you, it's very short, is not intensely violent. There are, in, there are very violent passages in here. But for me, it's one of, I, I have a very hard time with it. It's, it's very hard for me to even read it without crying. I will just read it to you. And then I would like to read to you something that um, Mark Memagonian and I put together that we were trying to place as an op-ed piece. It, uh, there's been all sorts of activity over the last week or so, so that's sort of in flux. But let me, let me read you this first. This is from Migrdic Karapetian, born in Diyarbakir, or Dikrenegir, where my grandmother is from, in 1910. Uh, he was born there in 1910, and he was six years old, in, obviously in 1916. They separated us, the children, and took the adults towards the valley and made them stand in a line. There were about three to four hundred adults, and we, the children, were nearly as many. They made us sit on the green grass, and we didn't know what was going to happen. Breaking from the line, my mother came several times to us. She kissed and kissed us and went back. We, my elder brother, I and my one-year-old brother saw from afar a line of women moving forward. Our mother was among them. On coming out of our house, mother was dressed in her national costume, a velvet dress embroidered in, glo in gold thread. Her head was adorned with gold coins. On her neck was a gold chain. Twenty-five gold coins were secretly sewn inside her dress on both sides. When mother came for the last time and kissed us madly, I remember she was clad only in her underwear. There were no ornaments, no gold, and no velvet clothes. We, the children, were unaware of the events happening there. So this is uh, from, uh, this is, this is a, uh, I was at the uh, conference last month at, in New York and Mark Mamagonian presented a letter, uh, uh, a paper, and I said to Mark, it would be great if we could find a way to get this into uh, beyond the academic circles who read these things. And, um, and I wrote this, and he helped me write this short piece. And I would like to just read this to you now, and then I'll read you a little bit more from my book. This is titled Denial 2.0. It would be a mistake to think of the Ottoman leaders who engineered the mass destruction of the Armenians during World War I as nothing more than bloodthirsty barbarians. To be sure, many of their proxies were intensely violent characters common to the frontier lands of Eastern Asia Minor. But the leaders of the Ottoman Empire, the key figures in the Committee for Union and Progress, specifically Talat Pasha and Ver Pasha, Dr. Behadin Shakir, and associates such as Zaya Golkalp, were urbane Europeans. They saw the world through European eyes and understood very well European law. To be sure, the eradication of the Armenian people from their homelands was a massive and terrible bloodletting, but it was not the product of a breakdown of civilization. Instead, it was, like the Holocaust that would follow only 25 years later, a centrally planned, organized, criminal act planned and prosecuted by wily and callous political leaders. This genocide, as it would later be labeled by jurist Raphael Lemkin, was a brazen attempt to completely restructure and Turkify what remained of the Ottoman Empire. It was carefully planned with a clear-eyed understanding of the consequences of such a massive crime. 
In fact, in May of 1915, the Allied powers made it clear that whenever the war did end, there would be severe punishments meted out to those responsible for crimes against humanity, the first time this term was used. For this reason, the genocide was structured to include its cover-up and its denial. Talat Pasha, a central figure in the leadership and in the planning and orchestration of the genocide, was very active in this regard. He sent directives to local governors, instructing them to bury the countless bodies so they would not be reported. He avoided outright massacres in major cities so that Westerners in those places would only learn of the killings by hearsay. He routinely sent his orders as two simultaneous cables so that one set of instructions would appear to preserve rather than destroy Armenians, thus laying the groundwork for later denial. The fog of war camouflaged a major crime. At the end of the war, records were destroyed and in fact significant archives remain closed to this day. The full cover-up cover -up and denial began once the Republic of Turkey was institutionalized under Kemal Ataturk beginning in 1923. The first step was to erase history by making any records that existed of the late Ottoman leaders' actions unintelligible. The Turkish language was reconfigured. The alphabet converted from an Arabic-based script to a European-style alphabet. Towns and cities were renamed, obscuring their origins. Indeed, a new history was authored. This new, cleaned-up version of the Turkish narrative was taught in schools and institutions with the same thoroughness as any communist doctrine. Eventually, even more radical histories, particularly of the Turkish people and the events surrounding World War I, were published. Here, absurd allegations were made, denying that the Armenians, an ancient indigenous people who had lived in the region for thousands of years, ever existed in the first place. For the last two decades of the 20th century, this reformulation of history and the direct denial of the genocide has been the entrenched position of the Turkish government. Millions of dollars have been spent to promulgate an alternative to what is now established history among most scholars in the world. Lobbyists have been recruited and scholars subsidized in order to support the Turkish position. The Turkish government went so far at one point in the 1930s as to lobby successfully against the production of the MGM movie, The 40 Days of Musada, eventually getting the State Department to intercede and quash the film. Of course, Turkey has been an important ally to the United States for a long time now. With its strategic location bordering Russia, Iran, and Iraq, as well as its close proximity to Israel and the Arabian oil fields, Turkey is irreplaceable. Turkey is a member of NATO. Turkey is the recipient of millions of dollars in aid. For this reason, that is, to appease a foreign power, the United States has avoided any official recognition of the Armenian Genocide. Why does Turkey persist in this denial of established history? Because it can. In the last 15 years, the program of denial has been stepped up. New techniques have come into play, as recently explained by NASA director Mark Mamagonian in his meticulous piece in the academic journal Genocide Studies International. Here, Mamagonian explains that significant scholarly institutions have now been enlisted in this rewriting of history, citing specifically the establishment of a Turkish studies project at the University of Utah. Utah, in turn, has for a decade now been publishing work by scholars who re whose representation of the events of 1915 aligns with the Turkish state's position, thus giving a sort of academic legitimacy to the denialist narrative promulgated by Turkey. What is going on here exactly? Imagine a major university supporting creationism or sponsoring a panel that supports the notion that global warming is fiction. Such sponsorship makes the spurious legitimate. Once the denialist position is underwritten by an institution, the Turkish lobby can then go to court to argue absurdly that both sides need to be represented when the Armenian Genocide is described, for example, in history books. This is exactly what happened in Massachusetts 
Griswold uh, against uh, versus Board of Education 2005. Though the proponents of what is termed with Orwellian overtones, the Contra genocide thesis led by the Assembly of Turkish American Associations, that's the ATAA, lost this time, it is not hard to imagine an ongoing war of attrition against educational institutions all over the US. Key here is the notion that there must appear to be some sort of debate over the facts. This is a tactic borrowed from tobacco industry lobbyists and those who argue that global warming is a fiction. For decades, despite clear evidence, tobacco lobbyists insisted that we didn't know all the facts with regard to cigarettes and health, when the truth was clear and indisputable. By doing so, they delayed any sort of direct response to the destructive habit. Making the argument that a debate is ongoing allows doubt to seep into the picture, muddying the waters and distorting the public's understanding. This is exactly what the Turkish denialists are intent on doing, and they are succeeding. Today, genocide seems almost commonplace. It has manifested itself in Africa repeatedly, as well as in Eastern Europe. The Americas were built on genocide. Most recently, the actions of ISIS in the Middle East are virtually identical to the modus operandi of the Ottoman special organization, as incidents of beheading, immolation, and the raising of villages are reported daily. Though the leaders of the Ottoman Empire were not the first to employ death marches or to attack innocent civilians, techniques were perfected under the Young Turks. The centrally organized and technologically efficient actions of the Committee of Union and Progress were a precursor to the stunning destruction of populations a mere 25 years later as the Nazis rolled over Europe. Who remembers the Armenians, asked Adolf Hitler, as he launched his armies against his perceived enemies? Is there a reason to remember? Is there a reason to acknowledge what happened? As the decades roll by, don't we have other things to focus on? Hasn't war always been terrible? Didn't the Ukrainians, the Poles, the Chinese, the Native Americans, the Filipinos, and on and on, all suffer as greatly, if not greater, than the Armenians? Why is it necessary to acknowledge this great tragedy at all? For me, the answer lies eight blocks away from my home in New York City at the site of the World Trade Center where thousands died 15 years ago. What made this tragedy even more difficult for the survivors was that there was, that was that there was little left of the victims. Indeed, the tragedy of violent death is amplified exponentially by anonymity. My great-grandfathers died in this way. Somewhere their bones lie in an unmarked grave. Denial is the final chapter in a genocide. To deny how these men and hundreds of thousands of others died is nothing less than a continuation of the genocide itself. And I would now just like to read a little bit from the book, which continues with this notion. And this is, uh, I begin the book by talking about my grandfather, and so I'm going to, I continue here. My grandfather told me stories from his life. It was his gift to me. Memory lies at the center of the nemesis story. It is the engine of an intense bloodlust. We remember, but we remember differently. Our respective narratives lead to different actions. Thus the conundrum of history. Were you there? Did you actually see it? Who told you about it? How can you be sure? And so memory and retribution are linked. But why? Why is it so important to remember what happened? All people who live will die someday, and in a few generations, most of us will be forgotten altogether. So why does it make any difference whether the details of our particular deaths are remembered violent or not? Perhaps the answer lies in the very fact that we do all die, that no one cheats death. We come into this world with nothing, and we leave with nothing. We all know, either implicitly or explicitly, that we, all we really have is our place in the memories of others. We exist to the degree that we know and remember one another, even the most isolated among us. We share a collective understanding that we are all part of a greater whole. Perhaps we will not be remembered as individuals, but we, the living, move through life surrounded by what the dead have left for us. The dead live on in the pages of thousands of books, in the bricks of countless buildings, in the flickering shadows of old movies, in virtually everything we see and touch, including our own children. For this reason, we must respect the dead. 
It is this contract of respect we have with those who have gone before us that demands we acknowledge how they died, and if they died violently, to seek redress. The question that is almost impossible to answer is what should we do if those who committed the original crime go unpunished? What if those who follow in the footsteps of those who committed the original crime insist on hiding the truth? What then? In the end, is there such a thing as justice? This book is an attempt to me meditate on an answer, not only by providing the facts as we best know them, but also by research and authorship and through your willingness to read what I have to offer. In that way, we honor those hundreds of thousands who are condemned to anonymous death and burial, whose memory lasts only as long as our memories do. Thank you.